Hey everybody, Chris Brown here for Murmur. I have the pleasure of being joined again by uh, Mahesh Ananta, the Director of Cardiovascular Services at White River Hospital in Arkansas, and he's here to show us another uh, case of complex coronary interventions. Hey Mahesh, thanks man, thanks for joining us again. Hey, thanks Chris again, thanks for having me. Um, I was gonna jump right ahead into the case. Um, this, is, this is a great thing that you guys are doing. I really, really appreciate you having me in this meeting. Um, just wanted to show you this complex case. The guy is, this guy is very, pretty complicated. Uh, reason being, he's had um, radiation uh, therapy delivered because of his uh, cancer in the past. He has oropharyngeal cancer. Um, and he came in basically with uh, end stem age troponins, uh, went up to um, 17. Um, and he has other comorbidities. And he's had some bad lung disease and stuff. Just showing you the diagnostic picture. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, the left side system, oh, yeah. the left, the left, left main um, distal part is pretty severely deceased, and then the ostium of left side, as you can see, is slow filling and it's Giant. almost uh, ninety-nine percent nodule or something. Yeah, exactly. So it's compressing that, and then um, it does get worse in the next view. I feel like RAO or LAO cranny at L job. But anyway, um, he, he does have all this disease, and r right at this point, looking at him, look at his targets. I mean, it's probably aortic osteal disease and uh, osteal disease from extensive radiation. But you can see the intensity of left main disease in this picture, how bad yeah, that calcium giant is. Giant nodule, just yeah. a huge piece of calcium. Like, it's just going all the way up to, to both, yeah. both ostea. And I felt LED was okay, but then looked at multiple views, and LED osteum was also pretty significant disease. So it's just basically but then a 111 disease. Everything is involved, just the left main, left side. Mm -hmm. LED. Yeah, picture, just, yeah. I was thinking, okay, let's, let's at least left side is bad. We'll just take a look at the right side, make sure that's okay at least, and then we can proceed with fixing stuff on the left side. We took multiple pictures, as you can see, just to just to make sure that I understand what the anatomy looks like, if it's even feasible for an intervention. And that's our right picture. I don't know if it's playing or not. It's taking its time to play. Um, so what do you say here to yourself when you're looking at this? I mean, because I always have this thing where it's like, oh, he's had chest radiation, and my surgeons are just going to say no. Right. I need to stop. Mm talk to people about this? Do I need to make like a two second phone call and say, hey, you want to do chest radiation surgery on a 70 something year old? And the answer is always, you know, absolutely not. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, no, this is the right side also, like as you can see. So this is exactly what I was thinking, from my, you know, um, I always want to make sure if the patient is just stable at this point, at least taking pictures, the patient should know what, what their options are and say they at least know for sure it's not an option for them surgery. Um, then it's better to go uh, and proceed with that. But he's having end stem age are going up to 17 and, and it's just he's, he has other things that's going on on top of this too. It's a little bit of infection he's dealing with. So I don't know if it's aggravating his blockage and causing it. There's no acute plaque rupture, but it's all co chronic lesions and aggravated by whatever stress he's giving to his heart from the infection, underlying infection going on too. So I decided to stop at this point. And his cardiologist actually is from another uh, a bigger hospital, actually. Uh, and then I, I did give him a phone call and talk to him. And he looked at the patient and said, like, ah, I don't think I'll do anything. I don't know if I'll accept for surgery. Um, and I'll just put him on antianginals and just uh, leave him alone on medication. And I said, can I transfer to you guys? You can just deal with that. I said, no, nah, even if I transfer here, I'm not going to touch him because he's just, just bad at that. Um, then it's just either medical therapy or talk to surgeons if someone will accept or not. So I ended up calling my surgeon as well as four different surgeons across the state and give them the, the, the background of what this guy had. So he uses his, his vocal cord is gone. He uses the artificial voice box or something. And then he does use his laptop to type out everything he can talk. And then he is extremely weak from his lung status. So the wife says, oh, he has pretty bad lung status. Do you want to send him to a bigger hospital so they can take care of him if they're doing the intervention um, to Take, to, to back him up. We don't have a full-time intensivist. We have like time intensivists uh, to come and help us, but we don't have a full-time intensivist. So that's a limitation of a smaller hospital like that. Um, but I'm just waiting here, looking, talking to this guy, talking to all the people, and every single person, every surgeon, as I said, just said, just said no to surgery. So, um, did went went back and discussed with him, um, talked about all the options available. Would you? I know this is always a discussion that comes about like. Um, what do you do with protection? No protection. A lot of people are like, yeah, I can do it. Just, just no protection needed and mm -hmm. stuff. But the guy's EDP was around 22 when it did the first time. It doesn't look too fluid overloaded. With that much bad reserve in his lung, with this bad reserve in the heart, I really don't start yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. I think you do this with protection. Even if his EDP and EF is normal, you got severe left main bifurcation disease and a, and a poor protoplasm. 
you know, this is the, and ha, who has had an acute coronary syndrome. So I think this is a, an ideal case to have protection if you, if you have it available at your hospital. Perfect. And, and another thing is like we always talk about, like, should we just open one vessel before the other? Should we just start with the right? Should we start with the problem shell? Like most problems left main versus just fix the other one, get some more blood flow so it can collateralize at least if something goes down. I had no right or wrong answer. I just decided randomly because my schedule worked out for that day to say, you know what, I'm just going to fix that RCA here and see how it opens up. Would you? Uh, yeah, I, no, I wish I knew the right answer, man. I think, um, <laughs> right. I wish I knew. I, I can't tell you. Uh, we fix a lot of the left-sided circulation first and stage the rights because we kind of do a big production with our cardiac anesthesiologists and, and our protected PCIs. But at oh, the yeah. same time, you know, if you can fix something that's less important from right. a total territory standpoint and get a little better collateralization, you know, are, maybe you're protecting the patient longer term. It's, I, I wish I knew the answer. Yeah. Maybe someday we'll have enough data to, to answer it. But I don't think there's a right or wrong answer as long as you're, you know, is, you're being as thoughtful as you are. That's all that matters. I, I agree. Like, yeah, I mean, this just worked out the schedule. I said, like, and I'll just take him and just, just uh, look at it and see if we can fix the right side. So we just did a, a wiring was not as problem as I thought. The, the lesion was pretty tight. I thought I won't be able to wire. But it was able to pass easy. Did a uh, carabell and a, a microcatheter uh, and a wire exchange for a rotavar. Just did a ablation on the right side. This just yielded really good. Um, just did osteal stenting. And I always talk about this osteal stenting. Sometimes I extend all the way up to the osteum, put a second wire, but I've started using this a stiff wires, like a Mongo second wire. I know it's a little pricey to do that for the hospital, but I did that usually with the Mongo. It just it defines the aortic cusp better and confirms to the wall uh, rather than using a soft wire, like a workhorse wire. Basically just, even though it appears like it's taking the aortic cusp, it really just kind of uh, layer. Yeah, of it blood. doesn't push all the way out. I agree with you. Yeah. 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 If you're and gonna use that, I agree. Yeah. Perfect, moderately stiff wire. So I, yeah. We fixed it up and then that's uh, Mongo where I pulled it back, but then um, this came out really good. We stopped right here that day. Um, right. The guy goes up to the floor and then they, they were saying that he's, he's having some um, tachycardia and stuff and things. And I'm like, oh shit, I don't know, perf something. And he has pretty bad reserves. So I had low threshold to just come take a look at him. So I brought him back the same day again, took a look at everything, was looking okay. But anyway, I'll just show you the, the left side system after a couple of days. Um, make sure we diuristim him up and all those and we just put it in Ooh, power. Look at that. That's yeah. a good picture of that, man. It's oh, yeah. A great it's picture crazy. of that osteal cirque. I know, right? Just, just hang it by thread. There's an OM right there. I'm like, you know what? At this point, I'm all worried about the proximal part. Just forget about all the branches. Just get yeah. the main vessels opened up. And that's a huge system. The PDA is not dominant. It's, it's a small, either co dominant or a small RCA. So the, the left cirque is basically most for him. And the LED osteum, as you can see, I'm not open up in the caudal view as good, but it's pretty tight in that area. No, yeah, you can see it. Yeah. So strategy-wise, I don't know if you would just want to stop here for a second and talk about what your preference will be, how to approach uh, one versus the other. Would you just tough. I think um, you know you can try and provisionally balloon all this stuff, and then you get to keep your wires, and that's right. kind of nice. But right. if you think you can't get across that osteal cirque, I'm I'm a pretty big proponent of just taking a one five burr and drilling it. I rarely see um, vessels close down next to, um, you know, the, the burr, um, I don't protect with microcatheters or other stuff because, like, you know, you're removing plaque, you're not really shifting it so much. Um, so I think that's, you know, a reasonable strategy, but if you can provisionally balloon this, meaning if you can sort of escalate little balloons to bigger balloons to lithotripsy or something, that's a very reasonable approach. Exactly. Yeah. And no, I, I agree. Like, there's no, there's no right or wrong answer to this. So I felt like using one, one, just just maybe just start with balloon see how it passes get a feel of like what it looks like and um if it is a roto i just mostly prefer to just go straight away roto rather than just like ballooning and creating a dissection pattern. right I hear you. So yeah. it's just better to just start with that but Troy says have you ever like any of the cases like used uh csi uh, versus roto because i i'm a pretty big fan of csi i've been doing all my cases with csi before but i now, now i've transitioned mostly to roto so I don't know why I did that, but it feels mm -hmm. to me, especially when you cannot get this like a small tiny hole, it's better to just get a track established and that's a goal of Rota more than creating more space. But um, do you have a preference? Would you, would you just do Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess from a personal standpoint, I have a strong preference to Rota with lithotripsy because I think the Rota is really, for me, is about delivering equipment and it's less about debulking things. You know, there is a paper, some people disagree with the paper that shows that most of the atherectomy devices pretty much make a path that's about as big as the burr that they have. And so, you know, maybe CSI makes a little bit bigger of an orbit. Um, 
But I think the reality is that it probably makes the orbit the size of the burr unless the vessel is already larger than that, and then it'll orbit out to that that size. But I don't mm -hmm. think it makes a 3.5 millimeter, you know, or a 2.5 right. millimeter it's path. Like if you do it like in that area, like I mean, as they ask you to, and you stay there for like that that long and one millimeter, and then you stay there like for like multiple passes in that one spot, then it may create a space. But most people, I don't think, we just like stop there and stay there for like that long. We just go like a little bit more forward and come backward. I don't think it's creating that circle in that same space unless you leave it for like thirty seconds in that space. It'll probably yeah. get four or four. Like, but I don't think it's yeah. gonna. But yeah, so we we just did. Uh, uh, so the strategy was so in this case. Um, when I did the rotor, actually, I don't know how much, this is the 8-French catheter, I, I don't know how, how many of the cases that you um, protect with the micro catheter, and I've never really protected, but I felt like I just wanted to try it and see how it helps, and I did actually use a Corsair and left it there, one of us uh, mm -hmm. doing the left circ. Um, never never did that before, maybe just a couple of cases during my training and stuff, but I don't know if yeah. you routinely do that, protection of micro catheter. I, I don't do it, um, but, you know, and, and I don't do it mostly because I'm a little worried about the plastic emboli embolizing. Although right. the way that these wires separate on you, right. I'm not even sure that your burr is going to interact with that other wire or micro catheter. So it right. probably is less of a problem in this case, and you do get to keep the protection. But, right. um, but you know, again, nobody knows the right answer, but right. yeah. Right. Yeah, that's... No, but anyway, uh, once after that, I said like I just did rotor for both left circ and then I just pulled back and then wired that um, LED and it was just a lot of rocks so and there's no point of just like fighting with it. So I just said I'll just rotor both and you start, start slowly expanding after and the chunk is still up there on the left circ ostium. But we um, I was did seems like I was a pretty big surprise the size of the vessel as we always get surprised with I was this was a pretty decent sized vessel like I could just do at least three and a half for the LED and the left circ is almost a four zero um, sized vessel. Um, then one, once after we wrote a, uh, then we just went ahead like shocked both um, to just make a yep. better experience. Now I feel like I mean, it also gives me a feeling that I can pass things better once a shockwave balloon passes and you're able to go full length and dilate. It also makes me happy that oh yeah, I can pass a good big shockwave balloon in there. So, and then strategy wise, um, I think I just have, if I remember right, I just went with the cool out, I didn't crush or anything. Cool. Just yeah. had like, uh, I love the cool out technique more than most people do, I feel. Uh, somehow I feel like I'm always achieving protection like all the way down to the last team, but I do, if it's a favorable case, pretty straightforward, just do a mini crush and nano crush and get it done. In this case, I felt like just get it all the way down. And the circle was a big vessel, I wanted to just tackle that first. And the angle wiring into the LED was not bad, so it's easy to wire through that. Sure. I better just angle that. Yeah, nice there. straight recross, I like it. Yeah. And then it was a 4-0 stent in that left circ. Um, that started opening up nicely there. and then That looks really good, man. Yeah, thanks. And then the LED getting compressed at this point, as expected, so rewired and ballooned open. So pretty straightforward steps after that. Um, I think I wanted to cover up to the middle part of the LED, just go, just go through the slides a little. And that's the second stent that's going through there. That's um, three and a half stent on LED. I just had to do a mid LED stent just to um, yep. tackle that area. And also, like, I, I want to ask you something like, you know, I know it's a little extra stent investment. Some of the cases that you feel like when you use shockwave and you're gonna dissect that vessel, you have a high chance of that happening. I sometimes do this, and I don't know if it's right or wrong. I go in the middle of the vessel, if I dilate it enough and there's a good landing zone, I go and put a shot like a 12 0 stent or something in that area 3 over by 12, and I just, just do the shockwave as much as possible. So even if you crack it and dissect it, nothing will expand past that stent. I've done it in a few cases, I did this in this case especially because I didn't feel happy with that proximal LED uh, length, uh, diameter that I achieved. So I just ended up placing a stent in the middle LED and then dilated a lot more in the prox LED. Yeah. No, I think it's a, a reasonable and a good point. And the way we do it is we, um, we would li do lithotripsy to the limbs, you know, both limbs, LED circ, and then we would put in an LED stent all the way back to near ish or proximal ish or however far we want to put it. Um, and then we would do our nano crush or our culo or whatever we're going to do, but we leave most of the LED stented that way without crossing into the left main. And then we would have put our, our circ to left main stent in like you did, and then, uh, mm -hmm. recrossed and just had a little bit left. So not too different from what you did, honestly, you know, you put in that distal stent and then kind of worked your way back. So it's like a couple yeah. of cases that I've done, like nothing against like this, but I have a couple of cases that I dealt with where, um, you had one area of like calcium and then you just ballooned it and dissected it and the dissection extended all the way to the mid to distal. I was like a oh, freaking bad yeah. like as a young guy. I had to still go do more stents up to the mid LED. He still had like a target left in the future if needed be, but it just makes you unhappy. Like, oh, I could just avoid that. No, I, I hear you. Yeah. 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 Trying to stop that propagation. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So 
this word came out, I think that's, I think it's a final few pictures that I'm going to show. Uh, he, he tolerated this really, really good. Really training. good result, man. No puzzle drop at all. Um, everything came out of different views. Just looked at a um, little mm -hmm. oversized tent for the left side, but on Ivis, everything looked really nice and, and no, no major issues. A lot of spasm. Every time I did that, the engagement eight friends that I'm using, he did have uh, a lot of spasm going on, but the left main was not any osteal disease at all. And that's where we stopped. And that's an awesome result. Yeah, I think that's a nice, nice tour de force of acute coronary syndrome, you know, from a de more of a demand situation, perhaps, and the way to manage that and get people, you know, complete revascularization, which is like the ultimate goal, I think. So this is an awesome uh, protected PCI case. So thank you for joining us, man. And thank you for showing us all your techniques and uh, showing us your awesome case. No, no, thank you so much. I'd love to join you guys in the future. And uh, and really nice to meet you in person. And, and uh, we'll probably continue having more sessions in the future is what I'm hoping for. Sure. All right. Bye, guys. Yeah.